And to introduce Drew. Oh, don't worry about it. Drew doesn't really need an introduction. He's a, he's a former president of the <coughs> Buddhist Society. He, he's um, served on he served on the exec committee for three years up until 2018. He oversaw many important structural changes, which basically has allowed the centre to function in its good form today. And you're a businessman and you've got a little boy and you're just going to regale us with tales of, <laughs> of monks on yeah. Mars yeah. after a meditation. Let's see, so yeah, let's see. Over to you. No, I mean, quiet. have we got any time left after all those announcements? That's, oh, I uh, tell you what, 7.33. Might have to go home. <laughs> if anyone's from the committee here, we might want to review those, uh, the length of those announcements. Okay. Um, Thanks once again, Sandra, and thanks for the Bruce Society for asking me to talk. Uh, this is, I think, about my 10th talk and um, second year in a row for the range retreat. So uh, I'll run a uh, guided meditation for approximately half an hour and then hope to give about a 40-minute talk and then um, a 20-minute Q&A. And the Q&A can be on um, anything uh, on Buddhism, uh, including the talk tonight, but any any question that um, that you have, um, and if anyone, we're going to do a camera pan later on. So if, if any, people maybe want to move a bit closer, if you feel comfortable moving forward, it, I don't know, might create a bit of atmosphere, um, or not. <laughs> I guess not. All right, I'll just turn the microphone up. Oh, one kind gentleman's moved. Oh, two kind gentlemen have moved out. Great. Fantastic. I don't quite have the audience of the uh, audience numbers of the monks. Um, so, <laughs> thanks, ladies. <clears throat> Brilliant. I thought I'd, for the meditation, I'd just ask the question maybe with a raise of hands. Do we want to do Ajahn Brahmali style, where basically uh, it's three words and we shut our eyes and that's it, and there's no talking? Or do we do Ajahn Brahm style, which is guided basically 80% of the way? So let's go for the Ajahn, hands up for Ajahn Brahmali style. Oh, not, and hands up for Ajahn Brahm style. Okay, let's guide in meditation. <laughs> okay. Alrighty, so let's, um, let's close our eyes. <clears throat> Just finding a comfortable position in the chair or on the cushion. Back nice and straight, chin slightly in. Just a few calm breaths. We might start with the body sweep. So we'll start with our feet and just feel the undersoles of our feet on the ground. Are they in a comfortable position? Do you need to wiggle your toes maybe a little bit? Stretch your ankles? Make contact with the forgotten feet after a whole day standing at work or working? Moving. And then coming up to our shins, the front end, the back of our calves, starting with our shins. Just giving them a little, a little wiggle and some movement and just acknowledging that they're there. And if there's any tension, that's okay. Just let it be. Coming up to our, our thighs. Give them a little tug. Are they comfortable for the next 30 minutes? You need adjustment. And then coming up to our stomach, 
classic place for tension. We feel relaxed in our stomach or is there maybe a knot? Can we take a breath through the stomach? Just acknowledging whatever you feel there, even if you feel nothing. And coming up to the chest. Just give the chest a little flex. Is there any tightness inside? Are you holding anything? Just taking a deep breath to fill the chest. And feeling your hands. Are they crossed together, holding one another comfortably? Are they sweaty, your palms? And your elbows on your thighs, they're in a comfortable position. Do they need any adjustment? Right up to your shoulders. What do the top of your shoulders feel like? Are they tense or are they loose? Can you breathe through them? And then focusing on the whole length of your back from the bottom to the top. Is there any stiffness? If there is, can a little bit of movement help? And then coming up to your neck. Is it tight? Is it loose? Is it straight? And then your jaw connected to your neck. And then your face. Is there any tension in your face? This is the one muscle that conveys tension to the outside world that people see. Can you relax your cheeks? It's the tension between your eyes, the bridge of your nose. And then finally, the scalp of your head. Do you feel a tingling there? And now we're going to come back to the nose. And back of the nose. We're going to put our focus on the breath. And for the rest of the meditation, use the breath as an anchor. If the rest of the body is relaxed enough, then we can focus on the breath. Deep breath in, exhale out. Deep breath in, exhale out. And now 
uh, for the next few minutes, just trying to focus loosely on the breath and possibly feel it at the end of the nose, in and out. With each breath, the calming of the mind. The mind being calmer by less and less thoughts of less intensity. If a thought comes, that's okay. You can just come back to the breath and let the thought go. If there's still too many thoughts, maybe you can let them wait at the gate. Maybe the thoughts are coming on the horizon, but they don't have to come too close. And you can just focus on the breath, not engage the thoughts of the day. each breath, not focusing on the thoughts, but feeling the relaxation in the body, feeling the relaxation in the face muscles as each breath comes in and out. Again, leaving the mind and now focusing on the chest. Feeling the chest on each in and out breath. Feeling the muscles.
then coming down to the stomach. And again, feeling with each in and out breath how the solar plex feels. And can you breathe in and breathe out, relaxation. And then coming back to the nose, feeling the breath of the nose. And perhaps now we're relaxed enough, that concentrating on the breath, we can count 10 out breaths without thought interruption. Again, if we didn't make it to 10, maybe we can try five. Count five out breaths. There's no thought. And now, <coughs> see if we can just locate the breath outside the nose and just freely focus on the breath and only coming back to the count if there's too many disrupting thoughts, the count to five or the count to ten. And now just spending some time in silence, relaxing on the breath.
last minute or so of the meditation before I ring the gong. Just feeling the relaxation in your body, coming back to the body from the breath. Well, I hope that worked for everyone. I feel relaxed now, so I might just go home and Sandra can do the talk. Sandra? Oh, she's gone. I uh, guess I can't. <laughs> it's a great thing on a Friday night to, um, to come down here and do a meditation, or even at home do a meditation. It's uh, such a better outcome health and mental health-wise than uh, going to the pub. I can vouch for that. Um, so, tonight my talk is, uh, it's titled um, Monks on Mars, which is really just a, a catchy title for um, looking, I guess, into the cosmos and I suppose uh, into, the, into the future and using that as a contemplation for, for Dharma. Uh, last year I did a talk which was called Dharma and the Dinosaurs and um, we went back in time and, and looked at, I guess, what you would call deep time of, of the Earth's history and use that uh, as a contemplation for the Dharma. So tonight uh, I'm going to go in the opposite direction um, because at the time I was asked to do this talk for the range retreat, I was wormholing down YouTube on various things in physics and space and time and I thought this is a, uh, a good topic to, um, to talk about because it's endless, apparently, the universe. Um, so I was going to divide the talk into three parts, uh, and the first part, I guess, is how um, Buddhism, uh, or the Buddha, uh, outlaid his vision of, of the universe and how, how it works. Um, and then we might dive into how science at the moment sees it working. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not reading from talk notes here, I've just got some numbers and I can't remember everything, so that's what I'm, I'm reading off. But... Um, the Buddha uh, said that basically we're sitting in a 3D matrix of existence and um, we have uh, realms of existence that can go uh, up and down from where we are now and also we can go out sideways uh, and so there's almost an infinite uh, amount of places that beings can exist and he saw with his divine eye after enlightenment um, beings coming and going in this huge, uh, what I would call a matrix, he wasn't calling it that in those days. And um, in, in the up and down uh, part of the matrix, in Buddhism it's divided into 31 realms of possible existence and um, those 31 realms are then, I guess, categorised uh, into, into four. So you've got, at the, at the highest point, um, the non-form realms, so the immaterial realms. Uh, 
then coming down, uh, so there's four, in there there's four subdivisions, then coming down from there there's the, there's the fine form realms, um, then coming down to the third uh, plateau is the coarse form, what I call the coarse form realms, and that's where uh, I guess the human realm sits, this realm of existence that we're in now. Um, and then the, the final of the four uh, below the human realm is the, what could be uh, translated as the, I guess, degenerative form realm. So these are places where you don't want to be reborn um, in, the, in the West. And I guess in the East as well, there might be thought of the classic suffering realms and ghost realms and, and hell realms. Uh, and then above them, the coarse form is more human type realms. And, uh, apparently the one above us in Buddhist mythology, they called it the realm of the four great kings. If it was modern day, um, it would probably get another name. Some of the names that um, I talked about in the suttas uh, seem very uh, medieval. That's because they are, because that was, the, you know, the Buddha was describing the universe in, in the Bronze Age and um, there was only so much that they, that they knew. Um, and then the fine form realms going back up, uh, the Buddha describes them as full of um, beings called called devas um, that aren't sort of gods like you would expect in um, other Western or Eastern traditions, but more like um, conscious beings who are, who have physical form that are living in places that are much more refined. But uh, in all these realms, including that one, they have um, uh, finite lives and are subject to to suffering. And then the non-form realms are um, where there is just pure consciousness and um, in each realm as you move as you move up there's less and less beings and there's more and more beings in the um, in the coarser realms as described by Buddhism which sort of makes sense in our material world it's always a sort of a even um, in wealth or um, great genetics or whatever there's always this pyramid of very few at the top and more and more at the bottom um, and so the Buddha said that, that these realms are also all impermanent and you can move up or down over lifetimes depending on your, um, on your, on your karma and your actions and nothing and none, no being in these realms is permanent. So that's one thing to get your head around, I guess, um, when we're looking at the cosmos. And um, in modern day science, in, in physics at the moment, um, we've detected only, uh, I guess, one, one realm that has three functions, which is X, Y, Z. Um, but according to quantum gravity theory, so quantum mechanics, which um, is still, I guess, a baby, a baby science. Um, in, quant in quantum gravity theory, uh, there's the possibility of another 10, what they call dimensions. So mathematically, there's 10 other, what you might describe as, um, realms uh, and 11th would be would be time and I guess I wouldn't be surprised in 200 years or something if um, uh, when the tools catch up when more tools catch up to quantum um, physics and things are tested that they discover that there are there are other realms and you know some things in Buddhism um, if you if you had to set it 100 years ago you'd be you'd be laughed out of the room um, so maybe as time goes on and quantum tools get better, um, perhaps other realms or dimensions will be able to be uh, detected and not only mathematically, mathematically written about. So that's, that's going up and down in the, um, in the cosmos. And then, and then you can go sideways. So sideways is, um, I guess, the galaxy and, and the universe. And um, this is where it becomes probably a little bit easier to do a Dharma contemplation. Um, thinking about realms can be, can be difficult because scientifically they're unproven. Spiritually, I guess they are proven, but I don't know, um, unless you feel it for yourself, you can be a little bit um, skeptical about it. But most certainly when, when contemplating um, the Buddhist cosmology and I guess the 3D matrix, it's become easier now in the 21st century to go out into the cosmos. Whereas if we were in the Bronze Age um, and say the in Bronze Age India and the Buddha was explaining to us, oh, 
there's other planets out there and there's other life forms, you, you wouldn't even be able to comprehend it. You'd be like, what? But if you said, oh, there's other realms and there's, and there's hell realms and then there's sort of deva realms, you go, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, so what we might find ridiculous now, you know, you flip it around two and a half thousand years and um, it, would be, it would be the opposite. So um, the cosmos is a very large place and um, in my watching of um, YouTube and the, um, I was just talking to Dennis outside before about one wormhole went down about the Nobel Prize winner of 2023. Um, I'll get to that, but trying to understand what they're doing and trying to understand the cosmos. I did a little bit of research for this talk just so we can get our heads around how, how big it is. So apparently um, in the galaxy there's 100 billion planets. And so apparently in the universe there's one, so I'm reading these off because they're such big numbers, there's one trillion galaxies. So there's one trillion galaxies that have 100 billion planets. Um, and this equals a total of, my favourite number, one sextillion planets, which is um, one with 23 zeros. So this, this is a very, very vast um, uh, entity that we're, we're contained in. And um, it's too hard to get your head around that, but if you can do a little bit of contemplation, it may sort of bring you back into, into your life and go, okay, maybe my problems, my problems aren't so big and maybe I can keep exploring the cosmos uh, to put things into perspective. And what did, the, what did the Buddha have to say about the cosmos in the Bronze Age without telescopes, satellites and modern day science? And there's um, a sutta in the Anagutriya Nikaya uh, it's uh, in the third chapter and it's Sutta number 80. And in this Sutta, um, and I think there's another one in one of the other Nikayas, but I haven't, I haven't referenced it, where the Buddha talks about with his, his divine eye, he could see a thousand-fold world systems. And he defined a world system, I believe, as uh, one with a sun and then a, and then a at least a planet around the sun. And in this thousand world system, he could see uh, beings coming and going and roaming and perishing according to their, to their karma. And then um, he went on to say, actually, he can see uh, a thousand, a thousand thousand world systems at the extent of his um, psychic vision. So... I calculate that as one billion. So he could see one, one billion thou, uh, world systems which, with beings coming and going. So he's saying that, there, that he could see a billion, what we would now call planets um, in modern day English, with sentient life on it. So he wasn't saying that um, they're all human beings or in Dharma halls, but he was saying that there was at least some conscious life. So we would say probably from, you know, insects insects onwards um, and that's that's an astounding thing I mean if we if we were here 500 years ago and we said oh there's a thousand planets out there in space that have other life on them you'd be laughed out of the room or burnt at the cross or, or whatever um, because at that time the earth was the center of everything and um, before the Renaissance in Europe anyway uh, and then everything just went around the earth and that was the end of it. The stars were just pinholes in the sky. Uh, and it's amazing that two and a half thousand years later, um, well, let's take a hundred years off it. Let's take 500 years off it. Two thousand years later, we've caught up to what the Buddha said, that there's um, a billion planets out there. In fact, it wasn't really until um, the 1950s that modern science was able to get their... Uh, mathematical calculations around how many planets were out there with sentient life. Um, and if I just backtrack a bit, so if the Buddha says that there was a billion world systems out there and we say that there was a hundred billion planets in the galaxy and not the universe, then that gives us a 1% um, possibility that there's life on um, sentient life out there on our level, out in the cosmos that we could 
reach if we had the right spaceships and technology. Um, and then there was a guy in the 1960s called Frank Drake who did um, a bit of mathematics and an equation when they had the first telescopes, like deep space ones, and they got their heads around, oh, this is how big the universe is. And the, and the famous Frank um, Drake equation said that there was 100 million planets out in the universe that could sustain um, advanced life. So that's... that's I assume human level human level life, um, and that might equal something like I don't know 0.1 percent or something of the total inhabitable planets. So suddenly those numbers start to make sense if you look at other fields in science and probability and statistics and s significant um, deviations to have. 1% of all the planets out there with um, uh, sentient life that might be at our level, or even 0.1%, which is still 10 million or so, um, that's, that's a lot, that's a lot. That's a lot of potential for, um, for life out in the, in the universe, and the Buddha had, um, had spotted this 2,500 years ago. And then... Um, so if we keep going with the, with the thought experiment to sort of convince our, try and test ourselves that there might be other sentient life out there and what does, what does that mean for the, for the Dharma? Um, one thing I've, I've came across in the last year or so, which I hope that other people have, um, have seen and maybe um, be contemplating, uh, was in the news, I guess unless you've been hiding under a rock, the United States government's been um, releasing footage of these military aircraft and, and other ships and whatever that have been capturing what they now call um, UAPs, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. If I was talking about this 50 years ago, I'd be laughed out of the room, but um, tonight I don't have to uh, because I'll, I'll read a quote from the websites, um, but the US Department of Defense, forced by Congress, in 2022 established the uh, all, I should get my glasses, the All Domain Anomaly uh, Resolution Office, which is um, an acronym called ARROW, without the W, established in July 2022 to analyze unidentified aerial phenomena. This is the US government, Department of Defense. Uh, this department was preceded by the UAP task force under the Navy who issued a report in 2021 saying they had 510 cases of recorded UAP sightings that were unexplained and to be scientifically investigated. They investigated 144 cases on file from 2004 to 2021, and were only able to identify one out of 144 cases of UAPs. 18 of these uh, featured cases were captured by military sensor, multi-sensor equipment um, with all of the aircraft captured moving uh, with breakthrough technologies. So that's a quote from the, um, from the website. So th this, came, this department got established in 2022, and then um, if you've seen this footage, it was all over the New York Times and all over the internet of these military aircraft showing all these crazy UFOs. Suddenly, um, it's out there, I guess, finally. Not that I personally was a great UFO believer or <laughs> looking up in the sky every night and claiming to be abducted by aliens or anything. Um, but I found it absolutely fascinating that, um, that the US government has sort of folded and, and set up this, um, this department and they're taking submissions and in investigating these things and um, have released the footage on the, on the internet. And I suppose circling back, um, I'm, I'm using this as, uh, as proof that um, in this cosmos that we're in, with all these planets and all this possibility of life, um, and then we've got these now public footage and cases of 
UFOs flying around, uh, there can be no denying that there's intelligent life out there and intelligent um, civilizations to some, to some degree. Who knows out of 100 million planets if it's just one million or just one other planet? Um, I suspect that it would be it would be more than that, and then again you just you come back to um, Buddhism and you go, holy scamoli, the, the Buddha got this right two and a half thousand years ago. I mean, he said a whole lot of stuff, and and some of it can be mainly right in your life, and then some of it you just put to the side, and then other parts of it like um, how many planets there are in the in the inhabitable or life-sustaining planets there are in the universe that's suddenly matching up with modern science. And then we're seeing these UFOs and, and you think, wow, so he got that right and he's got this bit right in my personal life and there's a whole lot of gap in the middle. Um, maybe I should have a lot more confidence in, in what he's said because um, there's so much more stuff that he treats and deals with in the, in the same way. Um, and so, if anything, um, a contemplation of the, of the cosmos can give um, more confidence in the Dharma and the, and the, the author of the Dharma. Um, and then if, if um, you really start to, start to think about it, you can go, okay, I'm going to accept the life planets, I'm going to accept the UFO thing, uh, the mathematical probabilities and all, and all the rest of it, then you start doing the thought experiments and you go, all right, so um, what would it be like uh, living in another civilization in, in one of these um, in one of these other in these other places? And what would the beings be like? Um, and what if I was I was reborn in a place like that? Or what if, you know, we get our act together in many, many years? And I think that, that the act would be uh, mankind goes to um, the moon base, tests out some technology, then goes to Mars and tests out some technology. Um, and then, you know, in who knows, 500 years or whatever, launches off into deep space when technology allows it. And then, of course, so I can segue into the title of tonight's talk, <laughs> if we went to Mars. <laughs> and set up some sort of base there in the year 2300, we would have to take some monks. <laughs> Not only because of the colour of their robes, <laughs> um, but I guess uh, it, it's a case of, like the man going up the mountain can't escape the man. Um, you know, we, we go to another continent or we go to another planet and we take all our baggage with us, all the good stuff and all the bad stuff. And, um, yeah, I would, I would hope that uh, if we were setting up um, civilizations in the far future somewhere else, that Buddhism would still be around and we could, and we could take monks to Mars. It'd um, be a good, place, a good place to meditate. Be nice and quiet. And light gravity so you could levitate as well. Um. <laughs> Bram could go, see, it's true. <laughs> So then contemplating the Dharma again, um, if, if you're in deep space and, and you went to no other planet what, and it was civilised, what would you see? Um, I think you'd see much of the same. I reckon you'd turn up and some alien who probably doesn't look too different to you because he's probably, he's got to have, or she's got to have legs or some sort of motion, they've got to have hands for tools. Um, and then once you've got that, you've got to you organise labour. And once you organise labour, well, then you've got to have society and governments and structures. And then once you've got that, you're mining resources to build the societies. And once you've got that, then you've got other societies who want to take you on. And then warfare starts. And, um, yeah, I think that if, if, you, if you turned up, there would be, there would be Dharma. Um, the person, I mean, I wouldn't even call them alien because they've... <laughs> they'd be facing the same problems as you. You jump out of the spaceship, expecting a big welcome, they go, oh, hang on a second, I've just got to uh, pay the electricity bill and then put my kid to bed and then we, <laughs> and then we, can, and then we can deal with you, but I've got to go to work tomorrow. So, 
so don't take up too much of my time. Um, I, just, <laughs> I just couldn't see how it would be um, much more different and how any um, being, especially a sentient or even, or even um, low conscious being, can escape physics, can escape pleasure and pain, um, heat, cold, suffering. And, and once you've got those lined up, it all becomes um, very, very similar. And then you contemplate it a bit more and you think, OK, so, so we go to another, another, another planet and it turns out they're roughly the same technology as us. Um, so then they're going to have roughly the same sort of problems. Oh, OK, what if we go... What if we find a civilization in a thousand years or something um, that's high technology, that's a thousand years above us um, or further along the line? First of all, they've got to get there without blowing themselves up with weapons, um, nuclear or otherwise. And then I'm not sure, um, even with that technology, uh, how you could imagine it, that life would be any different and that the Dharma would still be there and the basic um, problem of escaping pain and seeking pleasure would, would still be there. And if, if you think about it, you look at humanity and you go back two and a half thousand years to the Buddha's time and the issues that he was addressing um, for both lay and, and monks people, all of it is applicable today. The only thing that's changed really is the technology, so um, obviously we're not driving cars. Oh, sorry, they weren't driving cars, they were riding horses and, and all the rest of it. And in, in two and a half thousand years, um, the societal structures change slightly, but I think that the 1% the rich still rule. These days it's the billionaires and those days it was the, it was the monarchs. Um, so the titles will change, the people will change, but basically it's still the same. And I, so I think whether you go back in time or you go across the universe or you go into a, a forward culture, you, you can't escape that. And um, the, the Dharma and I guess the spiritual contemplation is going, is going to be uh, the same. It's just that the, the labels and possibly the vehicles that, um, that are used in that situation are different and um, and then you can you can probably use that as a contemplation for um, yourself where you say oh in the future it's, it's going to be better like um, once the next iPhone 6 comes out it's going to be better versus the um, the Motorola keypad phone but if I think about that, about this, this future contemplation um, of things being better, it's not. Just using the example of that phone when I think about it, um, so the old Nokia phone, the keypad, hardly a screen, um, it, it was not as advanced as the iPhone because it didn't have your email, it didn't have FaceTime, it didn't have all these different things. But then you had more time because you're not carrying your phone around. You're not paying $500 for a phone every year. You're not on the screen all the time. Um, and, you know, the classic for working professionals is suddenly they've got these smartphones in their pocket and they're always on call. The e you know, it used to be that you would only get a letter in the mail <laughs> once, once a week and you had a week to respond. And then it was, and then it was you get emails and... Um, you got a day or two to respond. And now, in the professional world, people send you an email and they're expecting you to respond within a few hours because they know that you've got it on your phone and you're in your pocket. And so in the days of the Nokia, that wasn't true. Like, you could not work for a few days. You ignore people or problems or do whatever, whereas now on these phones, which are better technology... Um, I think the, the stress and the anxiety and the intrusion of life is much is much higher. So then if you extrapolate that into the future, saying, oh, if I just wait for the next technology breakthrough or um, uh, not so much iPhone but, but other things, and then it'll be better, it, it won't. I don't think that it will. And really this is what the Buddha was saying um, two and a half thousand years ago, that it, 
it doesn't really change the, the basic premises of Buddhism and samsara, no matter the technological setting, um, is, not, is not going to change. And um, this uh, modern day fascination with technology, um, I mean, I, I run a company that makes technology and um, uh, it's even the products I make have definitely solved quite um, a few on one in particular problem in the engineering setting that it is. Um, and then, you know, we've gone around and spent years and years and we've solved it and now we're selling it. And then other bits of technology catch up and then suddenly it's a new operating environment and there's another problem. And it's like, God damn, what was the point of all that? And I, th I think that can be... Um, that can be the technology trap, which really is the future trap of always dreaming that it's going to be better in the future because there's going to be some wizardry that's going to get us out of it, but, it, but it's not. Um, it's really only the Dharma that's going to get us out of it if we, if we practice properly. And then if we contemplate the size of the universe, other life forms out there, and really properly think about how they would be living and the challenges that they would um, encounter it's, it's going to be much the same and um, a contemplation like this can do two things. The contemplation can be on the scale of the universe and therefore I guess the temporary nature and probably the insignificance of our, of our problems and this can be um, handy when you're right in the, in the heat of the moment and you sort of need to, you need to pull back. Um, and then, um, secondly, that that there's so far to go out into the into the cosmos, and there's so far to go up and down in the 3D matrix, um, and it can, with rebirth, just go on and on so often that there's there's nowhere to run. There's sort of there's no because of the scale of it. There's no endpoint, and really. Um, we can use that to be inspired to um, start the work now or um, do a bit more work now to, um, I guess, focus back in on our own spiritual development in the minute by minute, moment by moment, present moment, rather than um, once we get a understanding of the scale of the universe, dreaming that um, the answer might be out there somewhere when technology comes or um, there's another place where it's going to be better because the Buddha's saying that th of course there's the, the lower realms going down and other places that might be harsher to live but we really have to get through um, our own I guess Dharma and work on our own our own practice um, and yeah, I find that doing contemplations such as looking back in time or forward in time, which are a little bit different from the usual old age, sickness and death, um, is something that you can work on during the day. Like sometimes it's busy uh, as a lay person and you can't be doing two or three hours of meditation a day or even an hour a day and you might be skipping a day or two here or there. Um, and we all go through, go through phases um, of recently... I recently got up to, for 18 days, two or three hours of meditation a day, which was unusual for the year, um, and then trended back down to an hour. But then there's been periods in lay life, in my life, where sometimes you, you know, you're skipping days and it's not working. And um, you might feel a bit um, guilty saying, oh, I didn't get the meditation in today and this and that and the other. But there's other ways that um, you, can, you can further your practice besides a strict meditation routine every day, and um, one is obviously come to Dharma Loka, two is possibly to read the suttas, but they can be, they can be fairly dry and a little bit distant because they're written so far back in time. Um, but three is to, is to, from what you hear at Dharma Loka or a little bit of the suttas, is to um, apply the Dharma and the thinking of the Buddha and the stories of the Buddha to these situations like the cosmos. Oh, the US government said that it's seen UFOs. There must be people out there. What would it be like for them? Etc. Et um, and that's what I tend to do. 
to um, reduce the guilt burden when there's periods in my life where I might be travelling or, or whatever as a layperson and um, can't quite get the practice that I, that I want to get. Um, and it's certainly, even though it's not as good as uh, meditating at Jhana Grove and you're getting the jhanas and at Ajahn Brahm's retreat, um, contemplating the Dharma really is, uh, I guess, the wisdom arm of, um, of Buddhism. And, um, you know, as a layperson, you don't have to be intimidated by the fact that you're not um, doing so many retreats every year in Ajahna Grove. Uh, and unless you get the insight meditation, you're not going to be able to develop wisdom. Well, I think that, that you can if, um, um, you know, week by week, here and there, this and that, you make these contemplations and really think about it properly. Um, and I enjoy thinking about stuff like that and then going down the wormhole on YouTube or whatever and seeing some physics thing or that UAP office thing. And last year it was about the dinosaurs and um, it sort of adds another another dimension, I guess, um, and a, a dimension, realm, another um, richness, I guess, to, to your Buddhist practice. And you're not just um, coming down here on a, on a Friday night or maybe, if you're lucky, doing the Jhana Grove nine days retreat once a year and then you run back to your lay life and, and this is all sort of shut off until you get to 9.30 and go at night and go, oh, everything's done. I should try and do a meditation before bed, but oh, I've got to get up early and oh, it's not working, it's not working. Um, yeah, sometimes part of the problem with Buddhism can be just in the lay life, having that strong segregation. And especially in the Western culture, because in, say, the Thai culture in Sri Lankan where Buddhism is sort of ingrained and they're, and they're brought up in, um, in that because of the historical roots, in the Western culture it can be, it can be a little bit difficult, you know, you, you run home and then your family's not, or maybe your greater family's not Buddhist and, and you know, there's not this um, talk that goes on or ceremonies or someone's getting married so we go to the temple. In, in the Western world it can be, I'm just going to Dharma Loka on a Friday night, hopefully at a retreat of the year and then that's it. Everyone else is not Buddhist. Yeah, neighbourhood's not really Buddhist. Um, so what you can do, um, I think, and it's important and it was what I talked about last year, is contemplate different subjects that interest you um, uh, with the Dharma and do, and do an investigation. And, um, yeah, that's, I believe, genuine um, spiritual practice if you're thinking about it in that way. And um, in Buddhism, the, the meditation is only one aspect of um, the Eightfold Path. And besides um, the action components of thought, speech... Um, livelihood there's also right effort and right mindfulness and um, I believe that in lay life doing these contemplations with the Dharma on different interesting subject matter that you that you want to be involved in um, will develop wisdom and is part of um, right effort and also right mindfulness um, so these these Dharmic contemplations that aren't straight suttas but you may bring the suttas in to compare them uh, I believe is definitely part of the Eightfold Path. So, there's 40 minutes. <laughs> I'll, <laughs> I'll, leave, I'll leave it there. That's too much talking by me. Um, and that leaves us uh, up to 20 minutes for, um, for Q&A, which can be on, on anything really, Buddhism. Um, doesn't have to be the subject matter tonight, which was probably um, pretty heavy. All right, so there's a fair amount to unpack there. <laughs> you don't have to, though. So, who would like to kick off with a question? You would. You got the best seat in the house. Good work. <laughs> I'll just take this lady first. Yeah, yeah. We've got plenty of time. I'll come to you next. That's a great seat. That's the best seat in the house. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's very cosy. That was such a cool talk. Thanks. Um, yeah, amazing. Uh, off topic, um, I've got two children and one, the first one, when he was born, I 
I looked at him and I thought, I've met you before. And the next one, <coughs> who's the one that's addicted to gaming, if anyone was here when I <laughs> talked about that, um, I'm like, nah, this is his first rodeo. So... <laughs> <laughs> Just some thoughts. If you have any, please. Um, <laughs> let's just clarify. So when you say his first rodeo, you mean, are you saying um, you believe in rebirth and that this is his first life? Um, yeah, or... Oh, oh, for microphones, we've got... Oh. No, it's not his first human time, uh -huh. I don't think. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, I'm d I probably don't really understand enough about Buddhism yet to know, but it was just my instinct. Yeah. Maybe you skipped a few eons. <laughs> yeah, so, um, look, I don't have any psychic powers at see back in time or anything, but what I do know from being on the scene a little bit and reading the suttas is that... Um, We've all been going, according to Buddhism, through um, many, many lifetimes and in the, these realms that I talked about, which are all in the suttas, and you can buy charts and stuff about them and people write about them, um, spiritual people. Uh, yeah, we, we cycle through these realms up and down and, and um, ghost realms and animal realms and, and, and so on, according to our karma and um, your first son uh, if you think that you've, you've seen him before, then um, usually in Buddhism, most definitely you would have. In fact, the universes have been cycling in bangs and contractions for so long, uh, and we've all been going for so long unless you get enlightened along the way, which is a small percentage of people when they go. Uh, it's likely that um, you've been through um, many, in the human realm anyway, um, many social statuses, many sex changes through, through lifetimes, uh, and so then this gives you the uh, opportunity to be a mother, father, brother, sister. And um, there's a guy uh, who's now passed away, Professor, is it Patterson or Parkinson, Peterson? I can't remember. Um, he's famous. He's out there. Uh, someone else will know. Is it Dennis? Stevenson. Stevenson. Yeah, Stevenson. Yeah, so he, he's written it in the 60s. 80s, he finished up in the 90s, a few books about um, uh, cases of what he called reincarnation that he, he had followed um, and he had proven that children had been reborn back into the same family with um, sometimes the mother being the sister or, or, or whatever else and he did this through kids died in, had bad accidents and cut their leg off and big scars and then they got born in the next village um, and they were born with a big birthmark and then they were able to go back to that village as a four-year-old and point out all the different houses and name all the different people. Um, so that, that's... The, he went to places like Sri Lanka and India and all through Asia and also some places in America. So um, he was a professor of psychology somewhere in, in the US and um, did quite a good job of documenting and proving something like more than 400 cases. So... Uh, I mean, I absolutely believe it, and the evidence that he produced is um, overwhelming, so it's no surprise at all. And in fact, probably quite ordinary, actually, except that most people, most people don't realise it. And, I mean, let's do the thought experiment. Your, your second son, perhaps, perhaps he, you know, he's come from, um, in literal speak, he's come from three villages away, you know, and, and so you haven't, you haven't seen him before. And, and it tends to be uh, in rebirth, so I've heard, that um, people, uh, as long as their calm is good enough, they tend to get reborn in familiar places. Um, so if you're a real masculine sort of white guy like me, you're probably going to end up back in an environment like this quite a bit. If you're a Zulu in Africa, you're probably going to get reborn back there for a while because it's what you're used to. It's where you've come from. Um, and probably your second son, he's not, you know, this time he's going to Scotch College and maybe last time he went to Wesley and you didn't run into each other. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But read up on um, Stevenson or the library, yeah. <laughs> Get the other one off the computer. 
<laughs> That's no good. Get him down here. We'll brainwash him. <laughs> yes. Apparently, the uh, proof that there is intelligent life out there is that they haven't tried to contact us. <laughs> well, why would you? <laughs> Look at the place. <laughs> would you really want to get involved in this? In the Israel and the Ukraine and all those places? Yeah, exactly. No. That's what I'm talking about here. They probably, I mean, I thought about this. They probably um, look out and they think, no, we don't want any of that. <laughs> well, they're probably just coming on a zoo visit. You huh? know, just a day out, fly by, <laughs> look at the mess and go, nah, the zookeepers can clean that up yeah, exactly. and, ke and keep going. I, I suspect. They, I mean, they're going to be, they're flying around in these UFOs and all these military aircraft are photographing them and x-raying them and carrying on and not catching them and... It's, ob it's obviously real somehow, and um, if they've come from so far away, then they're obviously much more advanced, and, and they know not to get involved <laughs> in messy stuff. All right, who's brave enough for the next question? Or I'll just... Because <laughs> <laughs> this fella's helping me out. I'll, e I'll even take a comment. Thank you for... I'll take a rating out of ten. Thanks for the talk. As long as it's over seven. Um, Sorry. Very interesting. Um, it's not really a question, but um, more of a comment, as you yeah. said. Have you got a um, rating? <laughs> I had a thought while you were talking about, I guess, my own interest in the cosmos and astronomy. And um, it made me realize that actually when I was a child, I was intensely interested in the cosmos and, yeah, in cosmology as well. You know, yeah. just thinking about extraterrestrial life and planets and all of that going to the planetarium but you know that interest and that curiosity about the universe uh, has waned over time uh, where it's got to a point where I haven't even thought about any of this for so many years now and uh, I guess just contemplating the subject made me think about that um, diminishment that diminishing curiosity and in a way, I kind of realized, actually, it parallels, I, I guess, a, a process of diminishing curiosity about a lot of things other than the cosmos. And it probably has something to do with a uh, you know, shorter attention span. And also, I guess, when you grow older, you become more intensely focused on your own life and your circumstances, <coughs> and you lose interest in a lot of other things. Um, so I guess, yeah, I just had a moment of realization that, yes, I was very interested in this stuff when I was much younger, but that's completely disappeared now. Yeah, uh, um, I guess you got married yeah. and had kids. <laughs> 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 that usually does it. Oh, yeah, and just, just, <laughs> just, being, just being an adult and trying to survive in the world and, um, yeah, and look after others, a family if you've got it, um, it, it does. And... I don't know, it can sort of get a, a bit depressing and then eventually you turn up at a place like the Buddhist Society because you go, oh, um, I want something more in my life. But then tonight's talk and the one I did last year is about the, uh, the trick of combining the two and, and using the Dharma to look at subjects again like the cosmos. I bet now, I don't know how long you've been doing Dharma for, but if you go down the wormhole of books and YouTube and stuff when you've got the time and apply some dharma to it, it'll be like looking at it all over again in a completely new light. And you're like, oh. And um, stuff that might have been basic that you visited as a seven-year-old and you think, I don't need to look at that again. And you look at it again with a bit of dharma and you go, oh. Yeah, it's really, yeah, it's really good. I enjoy it. So, Yeah. Sandra, hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, Question. Um, very interesting talk. It's going to take a lot of self-control not to go home and go down a rabbit hole googling <laughs> everything until the wee hours of the morning. <laughs> 
Um, so my question was, um, if you can think back to the beginning of your journey with Buddhism, um, which ways did you incorporate Buddhism and Buddhist teachings in your day-to-day -day life at the office and the hustle and the bustle of all the things we do? Yeah. Um, I, get, I guess slowly, which at the time, so I've been coming um, since about... Um, between 2005 and 2007, I'm not quite sure, somewhere around there when I was working at BHP um, and looking for the meaning of life in my late 20s. Uh, and, yeah, I just start, I started off slowly and was attracted to <clears throat> the Buddhist centre because of the meditation and as soon as I saw the guys in orange robes and the nuns, I went, oh, they know what they're doing, I'll keep, I'll keep coming here. And um, I was probably quite sceptical of... Um, the Dharma teachings at the start, um, m maybe I thought that 20% of what Ajahn Brahm was saying was right and the other monks, Brahmali, he was just sort of starting up then, or teaching. Um, and then slowly, bit by bit, as the meditation practice grew, um, and it never grew fast enough and it was always disappointing, um, uh, yeah, I just, I started to put it into other aspects of my life and, and it was just come for a few weeks and then get disappointed and go home and try and forget about it and then get drawn back in Friday night, what do I do? Do I go to the pub or do I go to the Buddhist society? I don't know any of the Buddhist society. It's really cold and lonely down there. But the pub's expensive and I might get into a fight. Nah, I'll go to the, I'll go to the Buddhist society. So, <laughs> this is before I was president, right? Many, many years. We're all young once. And... Um, yeah, it just it just sort of grew over time at a at a slow rate, which I think was a was a good thing. Uh, I see a lot of people come in, and I don't um, judge them in any way, uh, but they come in and they go real, really hard, really quick, uh, and try and do everything at once, and suck up all the dharma and do all the retreats and do everything, and then they disappear and you never see them again. They just it's it's too much at once. So um, yeah, I would recommend the slow. Uh, more frustrating, more confusing approach to lay, to, lay a, to lay a foundation and just let it sort of seep in bit by bit. And things like, um, the big things like rebirth, years and years and years before I believed in that. Um, I just had to do my own research and other things happened and, um, and then I sort, of, I sort of came around to it by seeing things with my own, own eyes. So, you know, I would just say to anyone that, comes down here, take it, take it step by step, don't throw it out all at once, just take what works for you at, at the start and see if it grows and if it doesn't, it doesn't matter, you'll be back next lifetime. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hang on, hang on. Oh, the, the, there's a microphone coming. <clears throat> important words to say, I can tell. Yeah. Some people uh, look first at Buddhism and, and it just seems so f fundamentally right that they, they're just overwhelmed by, it, by its rightness, you know, compared to other religions. And uh, I was like that. And when I came in, I was willing to suspend disbelief because I thought that probably down the road I would come to understand what they're talking about. So uh, with me yeah. it was just... It was just something I just realised was the right thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the suttas they talk about, there's four ways to, to enlightenment and um, it's something like fast, easy is the best and then hard, slow down the bottom and then there's the combination of the two, of the two in the middle and um, it doesn't matter. As long as you make a start on the path, I suppose, and make some sort of progress, it's... There's lifetimes and lifetimes and it goes around and around and around, so it's not this time, well, it's next time. It's not next time, it's ten times later. One thing I will say about um, supposed... Uh, or, uh, about the path to enlightenment, I heard, I heard a good quote the other day, um, and it was... I think it's a long-standing Zen quote. Um, so you want to get enlightened. Well, the best thing is not to start... And the second best thing is, once you start, you better make sure you finish. 
which, which is saying that, um, you know, if you really get involved in spiritual practice, you've got to shed away some of the old stuff in life. But of course, you're only partly along the path and you haven't reached whatever the end goal is. Um, and so you can sort of be out on the, on, the, um, on, the, on the ocean without a sail for quite a long time as you go down the spiritual path. So sometimes, maybe not sometimes, but, but you know, ignorance can be bliss. It's going to be a difficult path. Maybe don't start. Because <laughs> once you start, you've got you to finish. You know, like when I was saying before, I started coming little bits and then not coming and then I just got sucked in and in and in and now, now it's too late. I've got, <laughs> got to try and finish it off. <laughs> to get rid of that. <laughs> I can't be in a halfway state. It's too painful. <laughs> Dennis. Drew, I was... Um, I wanted, wanted to just uh, ask you if you wouldn't mind to expand a little bit on the thing you were going to talk about, I think, from the start there where you were talking about the Nobel Prizes. And the talk's been wonderful, actually, in the way you've been able to draw all this together. But I wonder if you might be able to just sort of explain a little bit more about your realisations around uh, non-locality. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you know more than me, uh, which you do. Um, yeah, so the 2023 Nobel Prize winners, this is one of the rabbit holes I went down, um, they were three scientists who were involved, or are involved, they're all still alive, in quantum physics. And um, there was a guy in the 60s, an Irish professor called, um, I think it was Jonathan or Richard Bell. He's now passed away in 1990. He died at the age of 60, um, 62. Uh, he wrote a mathematical theorem um, proving that... Um, Two objects uh, not connected at great distance anywhere in the universe, uh, two objects that had, I think it was a history that are then split apart in other parts of the universe, can then affect each other. And this is called um, the non, the not, the not, the universe is non local. So basically, they got, I'm really getting out of school here because I'm only getting my head around it. Um, two, um, let's call them spinning balls. I don't know if they're photons or what they are, um, electrons. Anyway, two spinning balls, they're together. They split them apart and they put them um, millions and millions of miles away and they're not spinning and they make one spin and the other one always spins in the opposite direction every single time at the same time as the first one starts, as if they've got a communication line going on. Um, and they don't know how it's happening, but, but what, it, what it shows is that the previous theory of um, if you've got your air conditioning remote and you push start and the air conditions in Africa by um, the laws of Newtonian physics that we know about, you, you cannot turn on the air conditioner in Africa because, because of whatever, the radio wave distance and the rest of it on the remote and battery power. Um, but at a quantum level, they're showing that, that this is possible. Um, and I, does it mean the universe is not real? I, I don't know. I don't know how one photon connected to another one can then be sent to the other side of the universe and they both react synchronicity at the same time. I, anyway, they just, they just proved it. So this guy did the maths in 1950 seven or 67 or something um, but they never had the tools to prove it so this is what I was saying at the start of my talk as we get better and better quantum tools we can begin to prove these things like other dimensions etc um, and this was one they were finally able to prove in 2023 with some new instruments that um, the universe and particles in the universe can be non-local now straight away what does that mean for Dharma uh, straight away, I think about psychic powers in regards to that. Suddenly, one photon is affecting its sister photon and talking to it millions of miles away through space. Then it's not a great leap of the imagination to go, oh, if these spiritual gurus and monks and whoever, um, psychics, are, are able to 
connect with other people and see things, well, maybe it's true. If the photons can do it at a quantum level. Intention then, aren't you? Um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't really thought about it a whole lot, um, but yeah, yep, so. I don't, yeah, I don't know. <coughs> I know there's right intent on the eightfold path, but um, as far as these, the quantum physics goes and, and non-locality and um, photons affecting each other across, across time and space, um, there's a, there's a lot more implications to come from that. We're only one year from that being announced. So just like the UFOs were only announced two years ago, it's uh, interesting, finally interesting times we get to live in scientifically. Okay, um, a few minutes to go. Yeah, you can get it in if someone else um, I was just wondering, based on the last comment that you made, about psychic powers, is there also a link there that could be made with things like soul ties? Or, I mean, I don't know if you use that language, but when we've um, come into contact with a particular person that had an effect on us, you could be on the other side of the world. I remember an experience when I moved to London and it was quite a, a dark teacher, I suppose, I met in my life. And... Um, it was no closure, complete... I just had to leave the country, to be honest, um, and do my work to sort of get um, move beyond the entanglement. But I will remember one particular day where this strong message, it was just... It dropped in, like, out of nowhere that there was some connection going on from Australia, like, and it was almost like a, a strong sense that that person was trying to communicate with me and I don't I, I can't explain it it was just an experience mm. and I wondered whether he that person was engaging in telepathy or at that time who knows but I just wondered if you've done any thinking in um sort of in terms of the link with soul ties and how that sort of work uh, I'm not sure um yeah I, I don't know I mean I've come across um people in my life who have said, oh, um, a situation like yours, maybe not as dark, has, has happened. Or um, there's, Brahma always tells the famous story many times um, about the um, man, one of the Buddhist society members, his mother died and she came back as a ghost for six minutes at the end of his bed and they talked and then the connection was broken. I think it, it, it's all... I've heard so many ghost stories, I haven't seen any myself, um, and, and Ajahn Brahma, there's so many of them going around here that I just, I don't have any doubt that it's possible. I don't know what the um, requirements are to make it work. Do you, do you have to be highly emotional, like the death of a mother or something, and son cross continents and they briefly meet for a few minutes, or this person had a bad, very, very bad intent for you, and... If whether intent's bad or good, there's enough energy to make a connection. I'm I'm not sure. I don't really delve into that stuff too much. Um, but I also don't doubt that um, psychic stuff in a small percentage exists and is possible. And who knows what the science or requirements are for it. I don't even think someone who is psychic, like someone at like a tarot card reader or at the markets, probably most of them aren't true. Some of them would be true. They probably don't even know how they do it. They just do it. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? You got one last burning question, Dennis. <laughs> 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 okay. Well, on that note, unless there is something burning, we will say thank you. Thank you. I should will go, sadhu, 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 <laughs> all together. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank so I'll you. just do, um, and maybe everyone can, just three bows to the yep, yep. Buddha we Dharma Sangha and then we're done. I'm not going to do any chanting. Done. Oh, come on. I know you can. <laughs>